Uh, my name is Hillary Bassett. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks. And I want to welcome all of you. And it's so great to see so many people who are interested in Deering Highlands and in the story behind the neighborhoods of Portland. I wanted to remind you that Greater Portland Landmarks mission is to preserve and revitalize Greater, Portland, Greater Portland's remarkable legacy of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and parks. And to give you a quick preview of some Landmarks programs coming up, I think many of you picked up the calendar that we were handing out. We have a few extras if you didn't get one. And that uh, we have some workshops coming up, and Julie Larry is also going to be presenting those. They're on September 14th on Kit Houses in Portland with a focus on the Oakdale neighborhood. And then on October 5th on how to research your old house with a focus on the High Street, State Street area as a tour. And then those both are uh, available for realtor credits. If you're realtors, you can get credits as well for that. Our annual meeting is coming up on September 19th, and it's going to be in a great venue, which is the old Maine National Guard Armory, which is right across the bridge in South Portland. We've been very lucky that the karate studio on the second floor of the renovated head house to the old armory is going to be the site of our annual meeting. So come on over, check out uh, the restoration of the armory, the front part of the armory, and see how they've creatively reused it for a karate studio and convenience store. So that will be fun September 19th. And we'll also be announcing our places in peril there. The armory was one of our first listed places in peril in 2012, and we're very happy when we see those endangered, endangered properties restored and back into, back into service. On October 15th, we'll have a lecture with Earl Shuttleworth in South Portland, and the focus will be on modernism, the mid-century, mid-20th century architecture. We're going to be in the Holy Cross Church, and then with a follow-up reception at the South Portland Library. So that will be another fun way to get deeply immersed in modernism. And then finally, I want to mention that we have some books out in the lobby that you might be interested in. We published a book on Deering in 2010, and that has the, the history of the neighborhoods outside the peninsula of Portland. And so if you love this, these stories, there's some great illustrations and stories in that book. I'd also like to take this moment to thank our collaborators. The Woodfords Club is our host tonight. They provided this great space in this historic building. And also, we received funding for the Deering Highlands survey from the Historic Preservation Fund from the National Park Service. And that fund is uh, distributed through the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. And it's a matching grant, so all of you who are members and supporters have helped us do this survey work. And I also want to mention that CTN Channel 5 Community TV is uh, televising, will be televising this program. So if you missed part of or you wanted more to see it again, you can see it on TV. Or if you have friends who missed it, uh, please uh, call it to their attention. And lastly, I'd like to thank our staff. Uh, Kate Lewis, who is not here yet, uh, she's our development director. Alessa Wiley, our manager of education programs, greeted you when you came in the door. Chloe Martin, who's uh, saved the day with bringing her laptop from home. Lorena Coffin, who you, lots of you met distributing cookies and goodies um, today, who works in our development office. And Jessica Vogel, who is our intern. If you'll stand up, Jessica. Jessica helped do all the research <laughs> on this project, which is a big job. She's heading off to graduate school in library science. Uh, so we wish her the very best for, for that. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Julie Ann Larry. She is the Director of Advocacy for Greater Portland Landmarks. Uh, prior to joining our staff in 2015, she was a partner for 18 years at TTL Architects, a preservation architecture firm in Portland. And while she was there, she oversaw the restoration of the Portland Observatory, the restoration of the castle in the park at Deering Oaks, and numerous other preservation projects throughout New England. She also wrote the research study for House Island, which became a historic district about two years ago, and also the India Street Architectural Survey, which also became a district recently. And she is a Maine native, a rare commodity. Maybe in this room, not so much, but uh, Julie's from here, and she got her master's in architect, architecture in another great city, New Orleans, at Tulane University. So this is our first chance to find out the results of our survey that we conducted this summer. So I'd like to 
uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Julie to her talk, Off to the Highlands, Developing Portland's Neighborhood. Thank you, Hillary. Good evening, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. So as Hillary mentioned, um, we've been conducting a survey. So last summer, we received the Historic Preservation Fund grant from the National Park Service. It's a planning and survey grant that's administered by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. And this grant that we have are just wrapping up is the first phase of a two-year project to document historic resources in an area bounded by uh, Brighton, Deering, Stevens, and Woodfords. So the dotted outline. And the area we've focused on this first year is covered in red. And it's mainly the summit of the hill. Um, we're very pleased to announce that this month we received a historic, another Historic Preservation Fund grant to complete the survey for next year in the Deering Highlands. So this fall, after the leaves drop, you may see me and maybe some other people uh, roaming the streets, photographing buildings. So be sure to say hello, come out and say hi if you see me. Um, these grants, as Hillary mentioned, are matching grants, and the work we've completed would not be possible without the generous donations that we receive from our membership and our friends to support our preservation and education activities. Um, and I'd also like to second Hillary's thanks to the Woodfords Club for hosting us this evening. This is very, very kind of them to offer us this space so close to the neighborhood. The work of our um, staff and interns on this project this summer are indebted to the research conducted by William David Barry and Patricia McGraw-Anderson for Deering, a social and architectural history. We have several copies in our office for research if you want to stop by. Um, the Burbank branch of the public library has a circulating copy that you can take home and read. Or if you'd like a copy of your own, as Hillary mentioned, they're for sale here this evening in the lobby. This is a map of Westbrook in 1857. And in 1857, Deering was in Westbrook. In 1814, Westbrook was then known as Stroudwater, was set off from the much larger community of Falmouth, of which Portland, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and Falmouth were all a part of. In 1871, Deering separated from what is now the current city of Westbrook, um, mainly focused around the Sacarapa Mills and the rural areas of Westbrook. And it was later annexed to Portland in 1898. The boundaries of the city of Portland up to that point were confined to the peninsula. And so here's the peninsula here. And then an area, this is about the, the path of 295. So an area was also included in Portland that encompasses like the USM area where um, Hannaford would be and out towards Thompson's Point a little bit. Um, and this was the area owned by the James Deering family. They had about 200 acres. So that was included in the city of Portland. At the intersection of Deering, which was then called Grove Street, Forest and Ocean, which was then called Cove Street, Woodford's Corner grew up around a comb factory operated by the Woodford family. The area to the west of the corners was largely undeveloped with a few houses on the hill. So here's the intersection of Forest this is Ocean or Cove. Here's Woodford Street, so we're about right here. And there's um, Deering, which was called Grove. And as you can see, there's only a couple of houses up on the hill here. Um, there were, of course, a number of, um, of buildings along Woodford Street, which at that time was called Spring Street. They've all had different names. <laughs> so the corner was home to shops, residences, churches which you can see here. This is the church that was just restored into housing. It's now painted gray. You can see it used to be kind of a multi-tonal, multi-color building. And this was the train station in Woodford. In 1866, the Great Fire that destroyed a third of the Portland Peninsula created an incredible need for housing. About 10,000 people were left homeless because of the fire. And many residents in Portland turned to Deering as a location because it was less dense and it was hoped had much less potential for such a catastrophic devastation. Deering was also a largely rural area at that time, and it conformed to a very popular rural Victorian ideal of rural cottage life that appealed to the upper class as well as the upper middle class. Facilitating the development in Deering was the opening of the Portland and Forest Avenue Railroad. As I showed you earlier, there was a train station here that was more of an interurban that connected to other communities rather than a commuter train.
But the um, Portland and Forest Avenue Railroad was a horse-drawn trolley line which extended from the Portland Peninsula initially to Woodford's Corner here and then turned on Pleasant Avenue and went out to Morrill's Corner. Um, the line connecting um, Woodford's to Morrill's along Forest Avenue wasn't completed until 1911, which is why when you drive out through that section, you'll notice there's not really a lot of historic buildings out there from the same era that you would see on Stevens or even in this neighborhood. That line um, that went out Forest to Stevens and to Morrill's Corner was eventually electrified in 1896. So. That's kind of a little bit of a background and context for where we are and to look at the neighborhood. So here we have Deering, Woodford, Stevens, and Brighton Avenue. This is the area that we've been looking at in, within this, the larger survey. Um, much of that area was occupied, or owned rather, by Chandler Ratcliffe. Uh, Captain Chandler Ratcliffe was born in 1792, he died in 1872, and he purchased a portion of an 18th century 40 plus acre farm that had originally been owned by Captain William Pope that stretched from Back Cove all the way to Brighton Woods or the hinterlands of Brighton, which is like Rosemont. <laughs> and while we don't have evidence that remains of his farm, we know from census records that Radcliffe had 40 acres in 1870. He had begun selling off some, some land by 1870. He had a horse and two milk cows, so a small farm and his farm produced Indian corn and six tons of hay in 1870. Between Radcliffe's land in blue and that of the larger Deering farm, which is, encompasses the Oakdale neighborhood and then USM is down here, this is Fessenden Park, um, was this small plot of land that was owned by Nathan Mayhew. And um, Nathan Mayhew subdivided this land in 1854. That was the first kind of suburban development in this neighborhood and comprised of some several house lots. One of the earliest houses was this. This was it built in 1857. This is the John Johnson House at 90 Prospect Street. It's one of the first homes to be developed in the new subdivision. It was owned by John and Ellen Johnson. John was born in Gorham, was a merchant. He was part owner in Dow and Johnson Flour and Grain Company in Portland. He retired very early, in his 40s, I wish I could do that, and, and maintained a large garden at his house on Prospect Street. Unfortunately, the family eventually lost the house to foreclosure in about 1870. John uh, died in 1889, and he's buried in Pine Grove Cemetery off Stevens Avenue behind UNE. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Pine Grove, it was a cemetery that was laid out in 1841 by Westbrook citizens, and eventually the city of Portland bought the adjacent land in 1852, and that's what became Evergreen Cemetery. In the 1920s, this house on Prospect Street, here it is today, was occupied by Dr. Herbert Howe Cleveland and his wife Josie, who was the actual owner of the house. The house was uh, later owned by their son Frederick and his wife and sister Theodosia. Uh, Dr. Howe um, was a physician with an office on Congress Street near Maine General, which is now Maine Med. So he commuted to work. Another early house, um, this is uh, on land that was initially owned by Chandler Reckliffe, is the John R. Sawyer House at 136 Highland Avenue. It was built quite early, around 1841. John Sawyer moved to Portland, um, moved from Portland rather, to Deering when he purchased this lot from Chandler Radcliffe. He's listed in census records and land deeds as a wheelwright and a carriage maker. We know from city directories that his shop was on Market Street in today's Old Port. Again, another commuter. The industrial schedules of the U.S. Census record that he manufactured eight carriages and eight sleighs, valued at $1,000 in 1850, and got even busier. And by 1860, he made 12 wagons and 40 sleighs a year for a value of $4,000. We also know um, that one of the ways he was able to build all of this equipment was that um, in his dwelling, along with his wife and his three young children, he had four boarders in 1860. One was a carriage maker, one was a blacksmith, one was a carriage painter, and there was a school teacher. 
he and his family are buried, um, also buried in Pine Grove Cemetery. And there's the house today. This is not in Daring. <laughs> this is in Hiram, Maine. For those of you who've really been out in the hinterlands, um, John P. Hubbard of Hiram married a second cousin of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and he operated a store and a rooming house known as the Mount Cutler Inn on the road between Portland and North, Con North Conway in New Hampshire. Um, at one point, he moved to Portland and purchased 6.5 acres from Chandler Ratcliffe in 1855, and he built this house as well as an attached stable. He only lived there very briefly. He uh, sold the, the, in two years, he sold the house. It then went through a series of owners. He went through five owners in 20 years and was eventually purchased in 1871 by John W. Adams. So this is John and his wife. John Milton Adams graduated from Gorham Seminary, which is now um, the location of USM Gorham campus. He was admitted to the bar in 1846. He worked with John Poor, who was the leader in making sure that Portland could be the port for um, uh, Montreal and Quebec, and um, also founded the Portland Company, and was the leader in creating Commercial Street and connecting the two train stations along the waterfront. He also um, worked as an attorney with Nathan Clifford, for whom the Nathan Clifford School is named after. He gave up his law practice in 1857 to work for the Eastern Argus, which was Portland's Democratic newspaper, and eventually became its editor and manager, and then became its sole owner in 1866. He was extremely active in politics. He served one term in the state legislature. And his, the house was continued to be owned for a long period of time by his family. This is the house today, so I'll go back and just, as you can see, it was a pretty ornate Gothic building. And you can see just off to the left, the carriage house. So while the house has been fairly altered, <laughs> I suspect there may have been a fire or something. Um, the carriage house is largely intact, and you can see it down the long driveway if you're out walking around the neighborhood. So going back to this sketch map, here's Revere Street. This is the location of the Adams house. This was the Johnson house that I talked about earlier. So the empty houses, the empty monopoly houses, are houses that were built before 1857. And then the uh, solid colored monopoly houses are the ones that were built between 1850 and 18, 1857 and 1871. So you can see the, most of the development is still fairly sporadic, except for right along Revere Street. Um, Radcliffe sold off a portion of that street and it was fairly quickly developed. Um, this house over here belonged to Alexander Longfellow, who was a relation to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And eventually, this neighborhood down here, across on the other side of Brighton Avenue, would become the Longfellow Highlands, and named in part for his estate. This is a map from 1871, and I'll just orientate you. This is Brighton Avenue, Stevens Avenue, which was for a time called County Road. This is Woodford's. This is Woodford's Corner. This is Deering and Forest Avenue. So we have, um, this is Mechanic Street, which would become Revere Street. This is High, which would eventually become Highland. It used to take this little dip. Eventually that came straight through, cut through the Alexander Longfellow um, estate. And there was no beacon or prospect at that point. Um, we do have the two streets that were laid out by Mayhew in, in the 50s. We have um, Prospect and um, what would become Ashmont Street. So 92 Revere Street was one of these buildings built during this period. It was built by Leonard Merrill after he purchased land from Chandler Ratcliffe in 1868. He was 34 when he bought his home. He worked as a steamboat engineer, was a member of the Marine Engineers Association of Portland. His house was later occupied by John Morton, who I'll talk about in a minute, who was a Civil War veteran who for a time lived um, nearby at 166 Beacon Street. So there's the house in 1924, and here it is today, largely the same. And just across the street, we have 166 Beacon, 
It was originally owned by John Mayo, who purchased land from Chandler Ratcliffe in 1868. So all of this is happening just after the Great Fire. Uh, he sold the land with buildings a few years later in 1870 to John M. Morton. John Morton, as I mentioned, was a Civil War veteran. He served in Company H of the 17th Maine Regiment during the Civil War. But in his civilian life, he was a shoemaker. And he and his wife, Harriet, are both buried nearby in Evergreen Cemetery. So here's the house. Beacon Street is actually this side over here. <laughs> um, you can see they had a, a screened-in porch, which has been opened up. There is the house today. So Chandler Radcliffe died in 1872 and was buried, like many of his neighbors, in Pine Grove Cemetery. And his heirs, in 1874, laid out the rest of his land for subdivision. So this is Daring Avenue. This is Revere Street. This is High or Highland. Um, and then this is the new Radcliffe Street that was laid out. And this is uh, the Adams. That was that Gothic house that's been really altered with the, the big barns. This was Adams's land. And then this um, was uh, a Sawyer, was owned by another, another person, as well as this large parcel was owned by the Perkins family. So that subdivision in 1874 pretty quickly led to rapid development of the Deering Highlands. This is a bird's eye map of, of Deering in 1866. This is kind of the full map, and I'll zoom in on the area we're talking about. So the area in shadow is uh, Ratcliffe's property that was subdivided. And you can see there's, a, if you can peer through, there's a number of houses that have popped up within 12 years um, within this neighborhood. It was a very prosperous and heavy building period. And here's a sketch map that similarly illustrates what was going on. All of the dark houses are built within this time period from 1871 to 1886. So we start to see houses on the other side of Revere Street, up and back off Radcliffe as that is subdivided, and it's eventually the filling in of other pieces of the neighborhood. Um, around the same time, outside the neighborhood, we know that there was a subdivision between Ashmont and Longfellow that happened in 1890, just after this. And the Oakdale neighborhood was subdivided in 1881. And that's William Pitt, Fessenden Street, all the way out to Noyes, um, between Deering and Forest Avenue. One of the most prominent houses built during this period is 24 Fairmont Street. Um, 24 Fairmont Street, um, our deed research indicates, indicates that the first owners were Charles and Nellie Wells, although the house is more widely known as the Edward Lamson House. It's a very prominent Italianate style house that was built on the hill and orientated towards Beacon Street rather than Fairmount Street. Um, it retains its attached English style barn that you can see here behind the lettering on the tax photo from 1924. And here's a more recent photo. Um, you can just barely see the edge of the barn over here. The Italianate style was a popular style for houses built in this period, but another popular style um, that was prevalent was the Second Empire style. And the neighborhood contains several fine examples of this style, including these two nearly identical dwellings on Prospect Street, built around the same time in 1875. They both have a side L and a, a port porch and an entry off that porch. These are 104 and 110 Prospect Street. Very similar is a house at 138 Beacon Street, built around the same time period. Um, also in the Second Empire style, but a little bit different building form, is 79 Highland Street. Um, this building was later owned in the 20th century by Ralph Owen Brewster, who was a governor of the state of Maine. Um, Brewster served as the 54th governor of Maine from 1925 to 1929. A um, bit of a controversial figure. I won't go into it, but it's very topical. We will say that. You can Google him when you get home. The last decade of the 19th century and the early 20th century saw most of the neighborhood being finally built up with residences, much like the rest of Deering Center in nearby neighborhoods off Forest and Brighton Avenue. This is a map of 1916. You can see the peninsula here. This is the area of our study in pink. And you can start to see these streets. All these little dots are houses. These are all starting to build, fill in, be laid out and filled in. And then you have the big gap where um, Baxter's Woods is. You have Evergreen Cemetery over here. 
and all of this land off Ocean Avenue that has yet to be developed and won't be developed until closer to World War II. Zeroing in on our neighborhood, we can see that most of this area in gray has been laid out by this point at the turn of the century. Um, in green, I've labeled some of the additional subdivisions that are laid out during eight, between 1890 and 1915. We have a section over on Stevens Avenue called the Bell Lap Lot, which was done in 1884. We have the Jordan and Dalton Lots of 1897, which are, um, I think it's is that Greenwood Street that's back there. And then um, this neighborhood down here around Orland Street, which was called Fessenden Park Extension. It was developed after the original Fessenden Park, which is that V-shape between Brighton and Deering with Noyes Street. And um, around that same time, that's when uh, Longfellow Highlands on the other side of Brighton is being developed, as well as Coyle Park, which is um, Coyle to, from Forest to um, Back Cove. You can see Saunders Field, 1911. And then the, long, the rest of the Longfellow Street neighborhood, which was part of the Deering Estate, was subdivided in 1921. The areas in red are areas that remain unsubdivided by 1915. They are the quite late developments of the neighborhood. And part of that, of course, is, um, I was going to say the osteopathic, that tells you how long I've been around, um, Brighton Medical Center. Um, so one of the houses built during this period is 17 Fairmont Street. This was the Frank and Lizzie Larrabee house. Um, it was a Queen Anne house um, built in um, between 1898 and 1902. Uh, Frank was a traveling salesman for the D.W. Brunel Shoe Company. So poor Lizzie was in there with her kids a lot by herself. And there's the house today. At 83 and 87 Highland Street, is a double house that was developed by George T. Edwards. George T. Edwards was the principal, principal developer and promoter of the original Fessenden Park and the Longfellow Highlands, which grew up on the other side of Brighton. He lived in several locations. Um, we know from street directories, he moved around a lot. And this may have been a speculative dwelling for him. He owned it in part with Charles Miller. Here's the house today. Um, Charles Miller was a traveling salesman. However, he lived in the dwelling for a number of years. Um, we understand from um, newspaper record records that um, this house, the elevations were designed by Frederick Thompson, but the plans were taken from Scientific American and maybe may have been slightly altered. Um, it's Queen Anne, but it has some shingle style and some revival influences. And it's a pretty massive house for a double. And like a lot of the early double houses we see in the neighborhood, it's meant to mimic the single family neighborhood, uh, the single family homes um, that are in the neighborhood in terms of its style and its form to blend in, even though it is uh, a two family. We have 118 Beacon Street, which was built in 1899. This was done for Charles Foss, who was one of the founders of Schlotterbeck and Foss. It was designed by John Calvin Stevens. It sits on the very prominent point on the hill looking down Coyle Street. Um, you may know Schlotterbeck and Foss. There's still a prominent uh, Portland business, although just relocated from the Bayside neighborhood out to the industrial park. And their building, which was their longtime factory, has just been rehabilitated into housing and um, housing for Mecca, as well as private individuals. This is sort of a transitional style between Stevens' earlier um, shingle style houses, which he's perhaps most well known for, and his later uh, colonial style houses. And here's the house fairly recently. And I just want to point out this one, unlike a lot of colonial houses, which are fairly symmetrical, you'll have the same on both sides of the door if you drew a line down the middle. This one does have an asymmetrical front. You have a squared bay projecting here and uh, an, angle, an angled two-story bay on the side which is very similar in detail to this building, which is across the street at 132 Beacon. Um, it also has the angled front bay and then a squared off front bay, but has a very different roof form and is a lot more exuberant, I guess could be the word, <laughs> of this one. And while it's suspected, it hasn't um, been proven that this one is also by John Calvin Stevens. Um, 
132 was um, the home of Milton Jewell. Um, Milton Jewell, um, Milton was a superintendent of Union Mutual Life Insurance, which I believe became Unum. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure about that, but I think that's what they eventually morphed into. He died in 1936 at a fairly young age, but his wife and daughter continued to live in the house until his daughter's death in um, 1971. So that's one of the longest um, periods of residence from 1905 to 1971 that we've uncovered in this survey. Um, and as I mentioned, it's kind of a mix, like its neighbor of Shingle and Colonial. And here it is last fall. Uh, across the street is a smaller, more restrained dwelling that was built in 1908. And this was, for many years, Woodford's Congregational Parish House. Parsonage, yeah, sorry. On the other side of the neighborhood, as, as well as in many of the lower sections of the neighborhood, in the early 20th century, we start to see the construction of more two-family dwellings. This allowed owners an opportunity to live in a neighborhood that they might not otherwise be able to afford by supplementing the costs of their home with rental income. These houses were often made to appear like their single family neighbors in style and scale. 20 to 22 Orland is a two family house that was originally owned by John C. Bonson. He was a dentist. It was built in 1904 and we know that Bonson lived there with his wife and his two children as well as a maid. So they weren't hurting too badly, they had a maid. But they did rent the second unit to um, Trapp and Little, who was a high school teacher and his family. And there's a more recent shot of the house. Moving around the corner to um, Longfellow Street, I think Longfellow Street is one of the interesting streets in the neighborhood because it has examples of several styles of architecture from vari various periods of development in the neighborhood. And it kind of shows the evolution of style and form and scale within the neighborhood. We'll start first with this Queen Anne house, which was owned by Joseph Tyler and built around uh, 1896. Tyler was a draftsman at McDonald Manufacturing Company, a planning mill on York Street, so he was another commuter. He was also a Civil War veteran. He served as a regimental bugler in Company K of the 20th Maine. For those of you who know your Civil War history, the 20th Maine was led by Maine's own um, Joshua Chamberlain. He enlisted one month after turning 17, although at the time he claimed that he was 18 years old. He joined up with his brother Irving, who was 19. The Tyler brothers were both from Durham, where their father was a musician who taught singing, directed the church choir, and organized the town's band. Joseph Tyler survived the Battle of Little Round Top in July of 1963, and Joshua Chamberlain later wrote of him, he was the principal musician of my old regiment, the 20th Maine, and was a most competent and faithful man in every line of duty. He was prominent in our engagement on Round Top at Gettysburg. Here's the house today. It's a two unit now, I believe. Um, up the street, we have this large house and detached carriage barn that sits on a very large lot at 195 Longfellow Street. It was the home of Orrin Weymouth, who was the treasurer of Rufus Deering Lumber Company. There it is um, fairly recently, last fall. And then just down the street is this very small scale building. This is an arts and crafts bungalow at 173 Longfellow. It was built in 19, uh, 1912 for Albert Davis, who was a buyer for the Rhines Brothers Dry Goods Store on Congress Street. And here's the house last winter. It has a really cool modern garage too, I like that. Also on Longfellow Street, we have this more eclectic style home, um, which was built for Sylvan and Carol Shortliff. Sylvan was the head of Centrifugal Leather Company and owned a number of waterfront warehouses in Portland. Uh, the couple lived on Spring Street um, before moving to Deering around 1917 when this house was constructed. I think what's interesting in some of these uh, 1924 photos is you see how very little trees there were out here in the neighborhood compared to now. This one was under construction in 1924. This is the Herman Noyes house, um, kind of similar to uh, the Shirtliff's house. Um, but again, another one of those where you can see the, this neighbor had very long distant views because there was very little tree cover, having been formerly um, farmland. And there it is today. And then the last one I wanna um, talk to you about is um, 14 Highland. This is a, a much later house. Um, this was 1918. Um, was owned by Frank Adams, who was a photographer 
He was well known for his portraiture, but he was also a commercial and an architectural photographer here in the city of Portland. And prior to living on Highland, he had lived on Bruntwood Street. And then after living here on Highland, he moved to Kenwood Street. So he kind of always stayed right around Deering, but his offices were on Congress Street in Portland. And there's the house last fall. So we surveyed a lot more houses than this. <laughs> and if you'd like more information, if your house is in this section of the neighborhood, and you'd like to have more information on the house to see what we have come up with for dates and original owners, and you have access to the internet, you can go to this address, the main.gov, go to the Maine Historic Preservation Commission page, and go to their Karma Map Viewer. And you can zoom in on the city of Portland and on the Daring neighborhood. And they use monopoly houses to represent um, buildings that have been documented. There will be a short history and a photograph of the house. And um, you can see that we've done the central section. This is work that we did um, a year ago in the Oakdale neighborhood. And prior to that, we did a lot of survey along Forest and Stevens Avenue. So you can uh, take a look at those. Um, if you live in this neighborhood and you have some information on your house or want to know what we know about your house, you can also email me. My email is right there. Um, or you can also find the email on our website. And as Hillary mentioned, we have some upcoming events. So if you've enjoyed this evening's program, we encourage you to check out um, some of the other programming that we have this fall. I think particularly exciting is going to be Earl's Lecture on Modernism, which will be at the Holy Cross Church in South Portland, which I'm very excited to get into. And we're very pleased that um, the Monsignor has allowed us to use the church. And then we're going to cross the street afterwards and go to celebrate the birthday of the South Portland Public Library. And if Red's is open, we may go to Red's afterwards for ice cream. This could be a whole adventure <laughs> and celebrate modernism in South Portland. Um, and any and all of these events, you're going to find out more information online on our website. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.